Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I want to add one thing to this title, which is that everything will be kind of via example. So it's supposed to be a very gentle introduction to something that could be rather complicated. Uh, maybe let me start uh, by just saying some things I'm interested in. So I kind of maybe come from homotopy theory and algebraic geometry, also interested in condensed math and related things. And, uh, David Nadler has recently got me very interested in microlocal sheep theory. So I'm always happy to talk if anyone uh, wants to talk about um, uh, any of this stuff. Okay, so the main idea of the talk is that many categories of sheaves that show up in geometry and topology can be expressed as some sort of representations of some maybe more fundamental combinatorial object. So if you uh, don't like the word sheaves, don't worry because everything will be via example. So you won't really need to know what this means. Um, so I wanna start with some very classical um, uh, expression of this idea. Um, so maybe before I start, I'll just say to the experts in the audience, I'll make every possible simplifying assumption. So I won't state things <laughs> nearly in as general terms as they can be stated, but just to be uh, palatable. So maybe the thing that might be familiar, most familiar to people is what happens in topology. So say you have some nice topological space like a CW complex or maybe a complex manifold and you choose a point. And there's, um, a uh, nice invariant of this uh, called the fundamental group. And this invariant has this wonderful property um, that is often referred to as monotony that it classifies local systems. So locally constant sheaves of say vector spaces over some field are the same things as representations of this pi one. So if you don't like locally constant sheaves, think about the T being a complex manifold and the field being C. And then this is saying that vector bundles with a flat connection are the same as representations of pi one. And how this works is, well, you take your local system or vector bundle, you take the stock or fiber at a point and using uh, basically parallel transport, you have an action of pi one and this completely determines the local system. So something that maybe seems complicated because where it seems appears, it can be understood in terms of some kind of small combinatorial object, just a group. Now, the same thing happens in algebraic geometry. Um, I mean, these are actually both consequences of, uh, of some more general results, but so in algebraic geometry you have a scheme or a variety, think of whatever is the nicest thing you'd like to think of. And there's a notion of point called a geometric point. And what this is, is just a choice of a separable closure of one of the residue fields of the scheme. And attached to that, there is a profinite group called the Etal fundamental group. And profinite, this means it's a topological group, but the topology is pretty nice. It's compact house work and totally disconnected. Um, and why should it be profinite? Well, what it's meant to generalize is Galois groups of fields. So if you input a field into this, you get out the Galois group um, of automorphisms of some separable closure that fix the base. And this has a natural profinite topology because it's a limit of all of the finite Galois groups. Um, and there's a similar theorem uh, in uh, algebraic geometry. So uh, an important notion in algebraic geometry is uh, locally constant uh, etal sheaves. This appears uh, some, something kind of fundamental. And these are also classified as representations of this uh, fundamental group that are continuous with respect to this profinite topology. And there's some finiteness conditions uh, you need here. Um, maybe one way of uh, making sense of this is uh, to say that, okay, if we're assuming everything is finite, being continuous is very uh, kind of simple. Uh, it's really just saying you're factoring through some finite quotient of this group. Okay, so those are two stories where you have some category of sheaves you cared about, and there's a more uh, combinatorial object that classifies. Now, you can start to try to 
ask this type of question in more generality. So I want to do some examples in topology where you come up with a, an answer like this. So maybe a simple example is what are sheaves on the unit interval that are locally constant um, on each of these pieces? But this, uh, you know, this is not a decomposition into two open pieces. It's a closed piece and an open piece. So it doesn't mean they're locally constant everywhere. Well, this piece is contractible and this piece is contractible. So by the above theorem, what I need to do is assign a vector space to each piece. And then maybe there's some more data. And exactly the amount more data that you need to do is uh, describe a map from this vector space associated to the lower dimensional piece to the vector space associated to the higher dimensional piece. In other words, this category of sheaves that are locally constant along this stratification is representations of the quiver that looks like this. So, you know, you can do other examples. For example, just make this slightly higher dimensional. We have a triangle uh, broken up into these three colors. And uh, well, you can ask, uh, <laughs> what is a sheaf that is locally constant on each of these three pieces? And exactly what you get is a representation of uh, this quiver. You have to pick a vector space at this point corresponding to this blue piece, corresponding to this other piece. And it turns out exactly the additional amount of data is you have to pro provide as maps between them. Similarly, if you uh, look at a simplex like this, now probably we can see the pattern, <laughs> there will just be a representation of a longer quiver. But I mean, there are not always such simple things as, as these uh, quivers with no um, nothing else. I mean, we, we saw locally constant sheaves um, are classified by the fundamental group. So you can do something more complicated, like take a cone on a circle. And well, what's the type of thing that you need to do? On this black point, you just need to provide a vector space. On this complement, well, that's homotopy equivalent to just a circle. So you need to provide a vector space with an action of the integers. Um, so a representation of C. Um, and then there's some data you need to provide um, in addition. And maybe how to think of how to figure out what data you need to provide is like any path that starts at this black point and exits into the other point, um, somehow they're all kind of the same. So like, where does the Z come from? The Z comes from there being, you know, different uh, uh, maps that you can wind around uh, the circle many times and they're not homotopic, but they all become homotopic if you add this. So what you need to provide is a map from, uh, from this V to the fixed points uh, under this action of C of W. So it's also something kind of combinatorial. It's a representation of not exactly a quiver. Maybe it's some quiver with relations that has two, two objects. One has automorphism C, one uh, has no automorphisms, and it has a map to the other one so that whenever you act by this Z, you don't, you don't do anything different. So it's still somewhat more. Uh, somewhat combinatorial. And well, we <coughs> suspect at this point that this is uh, an example of a more general phenomena. So there's a theorem that goes back to McPherson, um, and McPherson <coughs> Truman generalizes, this, and the kind of maybe maximal generalization is due to Lurie. So if you have a nice stratified space, so something that's broken up into some <laughs> nice locally closed subspaces, like if you've heard of a Whitney stratified space, this is an example. There's something called an exit path category um, that classifies constructible sheaves. <laughs> and all of these examples above, these were computations of this uh, exit path category. And so yeah, constructible sheaves means sheaves that are locally constant along the stratification. OK, so this was uh, yeah, a story that um, has been known maybe for a while. And 
one thing that I wanted to understand with um, my collaborators was how to make this not locally constant anymore uh, version work in algebraic geometry, um, where things are in certain ways harder and in certain ways easier. Um, so I want to describe one more example to do that, and then I'll kind of state state a theorem and maybe some some open questions. So maybe the analog of this, like you know, just line stratified by a point, and and the the rest of it is um, something like the spectrum of a DBR. For this example, let's take uh, the DBR to be the PX. So this is some uh, ring with two prime ideals, the thing generated by P and, and zero. So um, what one of these sheaves is, you can work out, is a triple of data, kind of like what we were seeing before. So it consists of a continuous representation of the Galois group of Fp, which is the, the quotient of Zp by P. And this Galois group is something that is well understood. It's just a proponent completion of the integers generated by the Frobenius. It, can, it has something at the other point at the fraction field. So a representation of the uh, Galois group of the fraction field, which incidentally people have computed completely with some generators and relation descriptions. So if you want to be very explicit, you could totally understand this. And then, there's some relationship between uh, these two groups. And well, it, one's not exactly a quotient of the other, but there's something called the decomposition group inside of this Galois group of QP and a further group called the inertia group so that the quotient of this decomposition by the inertia group is the Galois group of FP. And this is something that uh, is true for any DPR. So, well, what can you do? You can try to write down a map from this group to the fixed points by the subgroup uh, of W. And that will have a residual action of the quotient, which is the Galois group, and ask for an equivariant map like this. And that's exactly the data of such a sheet. So you can imagine writing down some, some category that records all of this uh, data. And well, that's, yeah, that's the theorem. <laughs> so, but, but it works in uh, just complete generality. Um, so you have some nice scheme, and there's um, what you might call an atoll exit path category because it's an atoll version of the exit path category, and we call gal s because it generalizes gal galois groups. And the sort of thing it records is galois groups of all the residue fields along with their profinite topologies and the ramification data relating that. Now, for the experts in the room. Uh, what this is, is it's the category of points of the atoll topos, a quick <clears throat> extra structure. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Uh, but it's something that uh, the Growth and Deep School computed completely um, a long time ago, and then you can endow it with some extra structure. And there is a classification theorem like this. And basically what it says is one of these uh, sheaves that's locally constant along some uh, stratification, you can completely understand by uh, basically understanding representations of the Galois groups of every point and how they glue together. So in some sense, it's somewhat combinatorial. And this um, also works, you know, at a fully derived level for people who like this, this works for l sheaves. Um, it works in much more generality than what I've stated here. Okay, so I'll finish with um, some applications uh, of these ideas. So uh, one thing that interested us was, well, it turns out that this object, it's a complete invariant of varieties over number fields. This uses as input some, some uh, really important work of Wojtowski. So it completely determines these things. Um, and there's also something called the atoll homotopy type that's trying to assign homotopy types to varieties. Um, and it gives a new definition of this. So you can, from the thing we constructed, give a new definition of this. And one of the benefits is you get some new theorems and new proofs of old theorems from it. 
So um, some things related to these ideas that um, I don't know, I, I'd like to think about are, um, well, it turns out that it's not maybe so clear how to give such a combinatorial or exit path description of perverse sheaves. There's some progress about this in the case of surfaces by Dr. Hawk kind of, and Soibelman and other people in low dimensions, but it's, you know, that that's something that would be useful to know. And um, Nadler also has some conjectures about some exit path descriptions of microlocal sheaves. And um, yeah, that's maybe how I got interested in these microlocal sheaves, but these are related to Fukaya categories. So maybe that's of interest. And okay, that's uh, all I have to say. If your S is a complex variety, can if your gal S kind of some be determined in terms of the complex analytic exit yeah. path category? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, basically one way of saying it is if you yeah, so this one of the kind of differences that I pushed under the rug is that this gal doesn't work with a fixed stratification, but it kind of allows any stratification. But uh, yeah, there, there's a version for a fixed stratification, and if you take the kind of exit path category in the topology sense and do some profinite completion procedure, you recover the. So it's like a fancier version of the Riemann existence theorem. Sorry, what about the hypothesis in one on the variety? Uh, yeah, so it should just be normal of finite type over a finitely generated field of characteristic zero. So yeah, more general than number two. Is semi-normal not enough? Well, I think it should be enough, but uh, at least we use a result of Wojcicki that he did not prove it in this generality. But yeah, basically you should, it, it should because you just need to invert universal homeomorphisms, but somehow his proof does not uh, show this. Yeah. Thank you.